Hi everyone, thanks for joining today's webinar. We're about ready to begin. Um, just a few things to note before we get started. Uh, the webinar is going to take about 40 minutes and afterwards we'll have about 20 minutes for some questions. If you do have a question, you can use the chat box on the right hand side of your screen. If you can't see the chat box, you might have to press the pink button in the bottom right hand corner. So without further ado, I will hand over to Dr. Roger Gadsby for today's webinar. Thank you very much and welcome everybody. Um, it's lovely to be with you. My name's Roger, Roger Gadsby. I've been a GP 35 years and uh, been working at Warwick Medical School for the last 25 and been involved in all things diabetes. Ooh, yes, 35 years plus, I guess. And uh, also diabetes in older people, particularly over the last 20 years or so. And it's my privilege to bring you this uh, webinar on older people with diabetes in primary care. So the first thing we need to think about is um, who are older people? And if you look at uh, healthcare policy, um, talking about older people, if you're looking at healthcare policy in the developing world, older people are those over 55. But for this presentation and for most sort of healthcare policy things in the UK, and developed countries, we think about people aged over 75. So we're thinking about people aged over 75 with diabetes. From a large community study carried out in Wales at the end of the 1990s, which looked at over a thousand people um, with diabetes, the conclusions were that about a third of people over the age of 75 with diabetes are fit and healthy and living independently. And we don't want to be ageist. And in that situation, we would want to manage people according to NICE guidelines, perhaps as though they're 60 or 70 and not particularly want to alter any of the usual NICE guidelines for management. But this study found that about two thirds of such people are frail and have some problems in self-care and the ability to live independently. A number of those will have cognitive impairment. Some actually developed dementia. And in those people, we will need to modify diabetes goals because they will be inappropriate given the level of frailty. Until recently, we've not had any guidance to help us with what might be uh, appropriate modification of such diabetes goal. But fortunately, we launched a guideline from the International Diabetes Federation, so a world guideline called Diabetes in Older People that was published in um, December 2013. I was involved in the uh, production of that guideline. And it's a freely downloadable guideline about 60, 70 pages from the IDF website. So um, the, the uh, information there is for you to be able to get hold of that guideline because it is a very useful and important guideline because it really does help us in managing old people in the presence of other comorbidities. It's unique in world guidelines because it does vary the recommendations based on categories of need. Level one is, is those who are functionally independent, well and active. And as I've already said, we would want to modify those according to, um, in the UK, national NICE guidelines. But then there are recommendations for those who are functionally dependent. And we subdivide that into those with frailty and those with dementia. And then we've got suggestions for those in end of life care, which we define as the last 12 months of life. And you may know that the average length of living, if you've been admitted to a nursing home, um, is about 11 months. So I think one could say that those of our elderly patients who've been admitted to nursing homes are all of them fitting into that category of the last 12 months of life, or the majority of them are. Here's 
some of the glycemic targets according to functional category that we've outlined in this IDF guideline. For those functionally independent, we've got the 7 to 7.5, which is the sort of level of glycemic target that most international guidelines suggest. But we suggest that where people are functionally dependent, we relax that and may allow it up to 8% or 64 millimoles. Where there is frailty, up to 70 millimoles. Where there's dementia, up to 70 millimoles or 8.5 in the old, old money. And the only thing that we would be recommending for glycemia in the last year of life is to avoid symptomatic hyperglycemia. So hopefully you are able to see that these guidelines do give us helpful targets and goals in situations that we find in the older people that we're looking after in primary care. Just a sidetrack a little bit on diagnosing diabetes in older people. Um, the, the diagnostic criteria are exactly the same as those in younger people. We're suggested that we use HbA1c and the cutoff for diabetes is, is at or above 48 millimoles or 6.5%. Very rarely um, type 1 diabetes can present in older people. I do remember a patient in my practice um, who was 82 and uh, presented with type 1 diabetes, but that is extremely rare. We need to remember, obviously, that the large majority of people have got type 2 diabetes um, and the symptoms in older people may be particularly vague and clues to the need to rule out the possibility of, of uh, diabetes are people who are presenting with a, a urinary tract infection or vulvovaginitis or skin infection. And just a very rare but red flag symptom. New onset diabetes that's very difficult to control in the presence of vague abdominal symptoms like bloatedness and some perhaps abdominal pain. Remember that pancreatic cancer can be one of the uh, causes of new onset diabetes. So if we just think together about why we might want to treat people with type 2 diabetes, we want to treat them to obviously improve their symptoms because high blood glucose levels make you feel tired, thirsty and ill. And in order to make you feel better and to help those symptoms, we want to lower your blood glucose and improve your quality of life. We also want to treat people with type 2 diabetes to reduce microvascular complications. Clearly, the end result of the microvascular complications in the eye with blindness, in the kidneys, with the need for end, in treating end-stage renal failure and renal replacement therapy and maybe transplantation, and the end stage of diabetic microvascular disease in the foot and neuropathy causing ulcers and amputations. All of those reduce the quality of life and can, sh and can shorten life, so reducing quality and quantity of life. And we want to also treat people with type 2 diabetes to reduce their macrovascular complications. Heart attacks and strokes reduce quality of life and they can kill. So I know that's, that's stuff that's obvious, but, but I've just raised it because when we get to older people, clearly we have balances to make. And there's good evidence that treating blood glucose and treating high blood pressure and giving statin tablets um, for people with dyslipidemia can reduce the risk of microvascular and macrovascular complications. We could go into endless debates about which is the most important. But I think the large majority of, of authorities in the world would say that microvascular disease, particularly blood glucose, is important. Macrovascular disease, possibly blood pressure and the use of statin treatment is slightly higher in importance than treating blood glucose, but none of us are going to necessarily choose one rather than the others. 
but we have to acknowledge that the evidence for the benefits of these treatments come in trials that are usually conducted in fit, healthy, mainly middle-aged people with no significant comorbidities, typically uh, people aged 50 to 65 with type 2 diabetes as their only condition. And when you look at all the evidence that we have from all the trials that have been published in control of risk factors in diabetes, the evidence is weak or non-existent in, for older people with multimorbidity and particularly in the 80 plus age group. So we have to acknowledge that we have a problem with uh, evidence in the particular group of older people with diabetes, particularly those with frailty and comorbidities that we're talking about and thinking about particularly this evening. And the problem is that there are problems with treatment. If you do lower blood glucose too much, especially if you're using sulfonylurea insulin, you can get hypoglycemia, which increases the risk of falls, reduces the quality of life, and may reduce your quantity of life. Aggressive treatment of blood pressure can produce hypotension, and you get postural hypotension, people fall over when they stand up. That increases the risk of falls, falls reduces quality of life, and can reduce quantity of life. And there's a, a, a clear association with falls, fractured necks of femur, and hypoglycemia. So the point we're making is that we need always to balance benefits with risks, and that's particularly true of old people who are particularly sensitive to hypoglycemia and hypotension. As I've already said, we our main guidance for management of people with type 2 diabetes in the UK is from NICE guidelines and the NICE guideline was published in December 2015 and what it says is for glucose lowering individualized targets that early in the course of the condition an HbA1c of 48 millimoles is appropriate. Once people have established diabetes and have been living with their type 2 diabetes for some years a level of 7.5 is the threshold to intensify drug treatment and that the target should be to get to seven. So seven to 7.5, which is the figure, if you remember, that the IDF guideline is suggesting for fit, healthy older people. And the NICE guideline does say, consider relaxing that target if people have a reduced life expectancy, significant comorbidities and in the presence of people who are older and who are frail. NICE says to start medication for blood pressure um, to below 140 to get to below 140 over 80 or 130 over 80 if there is end organ damage. The NICE guideline says don't use aspirin or clopidogrel if they haven't got cardiovascular disease. NICE guideline gives us, gives us a stopping recommendation for GLP-1, um, which suggests that uh, it, shouldn't be, it should be stopped unless there's a, a reduction of 1% in HbA1c and a weight loss of 3% at six months. I think that's one NICE guideline that I have concerns about because certainly in my clinical practice and in um, most of the trials there are a proportion of people who do respond well to both HbA1c reduction and weight reduction about a third of patients on GLP-1s but in my experience and in the, the literature about a third of people respond better to one than another and I've had patients who've lost one and a half percent of HbA1c, but perhaps only lost two or three pounds. But to me, that's a clinical benefit, and I wouldn't want to stop the GLP-1 in that situation. 
Um, and clearly you have some people who lose 10, 12 kilograms in weight on a GLP-1, but perhaps may only reduce their HbA1c by 0 0.7, 0 0.8%. Uh, but again, in my clinical judgment, that is a, a positive benefit. So let's try and put some of the things that we've learned so far together in looking at case scenario. And here's Brian, and I'll give you a chance just to read through Brian's background. Now, many case scenarios might only include the first two bullet points, but we need to know that we're treating in primary care the whole person and the next two bullet points about his uh, his 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 background that he was widowed he lives alone he can't walk very far his son does the shopping for him um brian feels tired lonely and weary but if you look at bullet point two he's uh, he's meeting all the quaff targets and uh, you might well say if a person like brian came to your diabetes clinic in your in your practice you might say well done brian you're ticking all the boxes i'm going to get all my quaff points how well you're doing but actually are his treatments do you think helping him well we might want to ask brian what he wants and what the aims of therapy should be. Um, we might want him to discuss that with his son. And Brian and his family conclude after that discussion that the quality of Brian's remaining life is more important to him than attempting to extend his quantity of remaining life, if that might impair the quality. So, given an HbA1c of 6.8 and the fact that he's on quite high dose of sulfonylurea, Brian is at significant hypoglycemia risk. If we just slip back, how much of his tiredness and weariness might be due to subclinical hypoglycemia? I think also you might say his blood pressure is on the low side. And particularly if there's any signs of postural hypotension, you might well want to say, let's stop some of his antihypertensive medication. And you might want to stop the simvastatin if you conclude that the risks of that simvastatin outweigh any benefits. Here's a much more complicated case scenario. And this comes from some research I've done that I've talked to you about a bit later on. So here's Mabel. She's 84 years old. She's been in a nursing home for six months. She was discharged to that nursing home from a district general hospital where she'd been for about six weeks having suffered a severe stroke. Mabel now can't speak. She's bedbound. And because when she was screened in the hospital, she had was felt to have more than a 20% risk of aspiration. She's actually had, got a peg feed tube in situ. And she's had type 2 diabetes for 20 years. When you visit her as primary care healthcare professional, in the nursing home, you find that her blood pressure is 110 over 70. Remember, she's lying down in bed. Total cholesterol is 4.2. HbA1c is 8.2. And she's been treated, or she was discharged from the hospital. And the, these treatments have been carried on, continued of dispersible aspirin, simvastatin oral solution, ramipril oral solution, insulin glargine, Omeprazole, metformin solution, and cocodamol dispersible. And the reason why those CVD prevention treatments are in oral solution is because of the uh, fear that, um, or they, they need to be given via the peg feed.
and this is a, a, um, a scenario based on some patients in some research I did. And the question I, I might want to ask is, is what is the rationale behind these medications? And what might be done? Again, we would try to ascertain Mabel's wishes along with those of her family and carers. We might want to stop her Ramipril because her blood pressure is rather low. We might want to stop a simvastatin, aspirin and glargine because there is really no evidence for the benefit of any of those. Remember with Mabel, we're going to be in the last year of her life statistically and we might want to change to soluble paracetamol. And those treatment suggestions are supported by the IDF guidelines, which suggest, as I've already stated to you, uh, that the only important thing in the, the last year of life is, is to just make sure the glucose levels don't go so high that people become feel ill with them. And so you might say that there's considerable amount of overtreatment in Mabel, um, that you could reduce the uh, medications considerably. And it, it's also um, why isn't it? Okay, so may I just share with you a little bit more of my research in nursing homes. So we're, we're moving talk now from those in um, with with who are independently living with type two diabetes, particularly to those nursing home patients, because these are a particular subsection of our older people with diabetes. And I worked for three years actually, um, one day a week reviewing people with diabetes in nursing homes in Coventry because I wanted to try and improve the quality of life with people. And I did a baseline audit of how many people there were with diabetes, what their levels of disability were, their comorbidities and their medications. And we've published um, this work in a number of papers in diabetic medicine. Why is it doing? So in Coventry, there were 11 nursing homes with 472 beds with 75 residents known to have diabetes, which is a, a prevalence rate of 16%, which is in line with other national studies. The age range was 55 to 102. A person with 50, uh, age 55 had had a, a myocardial infarction and a cardiac arrest and had brain damage post cardiac arrest. The lady with 102 was particularly interesting. Um, she refused all medications for the last five years and she was on no treatment at all. Mean age of 80.6, a mean of four comorbidities with a range of one to eight. One of the incredible things was the level of disability and nursing care. 43% of those residents were bed bound, unable to speak, were doubly incontinent and unable to feed themselves. And 14 of them had got peg feeds in place. When you look at the medications that were prescribed for these patients, um, it was incredible. Um, 84% were prescribed four or more medications, 59% on antiplatelet medications, 41% on statin therapy, and 24% had a monthly prescription cost of above £101 a month, mostly because they were on these special order liquid medications for their peg feeds. And when you look at the pricing of that, all simvastatin, as you know, is uh, 152 quid a month compared to £1.52. Um, for the ordinary tablets, or bisoprolol is 
360 pounds a month we have one patient on oral prosopril so huge prescribing problems so my aims in this study were to try and improve quality of life and one of the things that we discovered that there was possibility of reducing burden of unhelpful uh, and no longer necessary medications one of the other things that i found as i went around the nursing homes was that there was a particular um, concern that people with diabetes in nursing homes might get raised blood sugars due to the fact that they were eating too much sugar or chocolate and you've got situations in these nursing homes where patients with diabetes were denied the uh, slice of birthday cake um, when a resident had a birthday or were denied the uh, bits of chocolate at Christmas and at Easter and things like that and what I tried to get across to staff in nursing homes that there was no problem whatsoever for the occasional um, treat of a piece of birthday cake there was no problem at all with the treat of some chocolate and uh, loosening up a little bit on the needs and the dietary requirements in these situations helped to hope to improve the quality of life for these people living with diabetes rather than uh, and, and and certainly wouldn't do any problem with the quantity of life I think we need to have realistic blood pressure, HbA1c and cholesterol targets, and if necessary, um, to exempt, well, no, it, it is necessary, I think, to exempt from quaff people with type 2 diabetes in nursing homes, because actually uh, the quaff regulations are not appropriate for them. The problem is, how are we going to make changes to prescribing in people um, living in nursing homes because GPs are very busy and we tend only to respond reactively rather than proactively to residents in nursing homes. So one of the conclusions of my research was to employ pharmacists to review prescribing in residents in nursing homes and bring suggestions of what therapies could be reduced or stopped. Several PCTs um, and you can tell um, I was, I'm, I was uh, referring to PCTs because uh, this was um, conclusions I drew up in, in 2011-12, um, but several CCGs or bits of CCGs have, have gone and used this model, and uh, certainly we were able in one in one situation by introducing um, pharmacist oversight of prescribing and review of prescribing, we were able to reduce the budget by fifty thousand pounds. There are guidelines of management for people with diabetes in care homes and uh, the Diabetes UK website has that document which I was involved in writing and uh, there's the, the link to it. But what we have to say is that um, there is still ongoing issues in care home diabetes I was involved in a survey that we was done um, from the University of Bedfordshire in 2014. We got over 2,000 responses from the 9,000 care homes, so a response rate of 23%. A third of homes had no written hypoglycemia policy. 60% of care homes had no diabetes screening policy. Residents did seem to have an annual review, but most care homes didn't have that annual review information available to them. And there was really a spectrum of poor communication between the care home and primary care. Half the care homes didn't seem to be aware of the national diabetes UK guidelines for care homes. And a third of homes admitted that they didn't have direct access to education and training for their care home staff. So if I just now in these final few moments summarise the main messages of the 
presentation this evening. Two thirds of patients with people with diabetes of age 75 or over have problems living independently and therefore may require modification to their diabetes treatment goals. A third of patients tend to be fit and healthy and uh, we would want not to be ageist about their management. But I've emphasized the problem and difficulty that we have where there is multimorbidity, particularly cognitive impairment, dementia, and we need in that situation to treat every person as an individual and be prepared to relax treatment, diabetes treatment goals and targets. And I would want to perhaps add as well that I think my personal view is that we ought to be moving away from the use of sulfonylurea preparations in such older people because of the huge risk that they pose of hypoglycemia. And the particular concern I have is that somebody, as in the case scenario of Brian, with who person who has a good, in double inverted commas, HbA1c below seven, may actually be subclinically hypoglycemic for part of the day or most of the day even perhaps. Presentation, we've talked about the IDF guideline for older people with type 2 diabetes and that proves, that gives us recommendations for management based on levels of impairment and disability. There's evidence of overtreatment in people with diabetes in the nursing home population, as I've, I've shown from my research, and my, my research backs up other international research that has been done. And there's opportunity for particular, particularly looking at people in nursing homes, realizing that for the majority of them, they're going to be in their last year of life, that there's nothing much we can do to increase the quantity of that life and that there may be significant amounts of overprescribing, which may impair the quality of remaining life. And there are good practice guidelines that have been written for care home diabetes. But the care home audit reveals still that there are significant deficiencies in management of people in care homes with diabetes. So I hope that's been helpful. We've uh, got through it a bit quicker than I was hoping that I thought we might. So there's plenty of time for questions. We'd like to um, for you to um, um, type in your questions. I'll then uh, um, repeat the question that's been asked and then try and answer it. So hopefully you can all be uh, informed of the question and then uh, answers. I'm just reading uh, so Rosalind is saying that you've got employing three pharmacists and a dietitian to a nursing and residential home residents. That's absolutely great. And I'm sure that uh, those pharmacists will be able to suggest areas where prescribing might be able to be improved. And, uh, and that can be, that can, re that can reduce pharmacy costs as well and can be uh, really very, very positive in terms of cost effectiveness of care. And as I said, by reducing unnecessary medications, we're improving the quality of life, quality of remaining life. Um, as I say, I think we can be confident that there's not, nothing much we can do to actually increase quantity of life in such people with, with significant levels of disability and, and nursing care. But what we can do is make their remaining life as high a quality as possible. So I'm waiting for people to type questions in. Anything else that you might uh, want to ask? Can I directly ask you then, um, what do you think of Brian? The, the problem with people like Brian is that they very often, if they can, they're brought to uh, a, an annual review clinic in primary care and everybody says how well, Brian, you're doing. Your blood pressure's well under the target. 
your cholesterol is well under the target, your HbA1c is well under the target, and don't realize that actually there may be significant overtreatment. Hi, Gareth. Um, question from Gareth. Um, stopping, stopping insulin in frail elderly patients. How quickly would you titrate insulin dosage down with a view to stopping? So we need to, why is the patient on insulin? If, for example, the patient has got type 1 diabetes, we are going to need to keep them on insulin. If you feel that their HbA1c is too low, even if they've got type 1 diabetes, I would suggest only very slow reduction in insulin, perhaps only two units every two or three days. And you would want to try and institute some measure of blood glucose at the time to help in discerning that. For patients with type 2 diabetes on insulin, I think the question is what level of HbA1c have they got? How many units of insulin are they on? If we go back to Brian, if you remember the case scenario with Brian, he was on 40 units of glargine and metformin. And I think you could say in that situation, you might be able to down titrate the glargine quite quickly because you're ascertaining that hypoglycemia may be a real significant problem. And, oh no, actually, can I, am I allowed, to, can, can I go, I'm just asking my moderator here, can I go back? So let's, I may be talking absolute rubbish. So let's go back and try and answer your question, Gareth by looking at, no, uh, sorry, Brian has isn't on um, insulin. So what I would do with Brian is just stop his glycoside. Going on, going on to Mabel, um, if you remember, Mabel was on 40 units of glargine. She got an HbA1c of 8.2 um, and she's on metformin. I think what I do in that situation is halve the halve the, the glargine dose, carry on with the metformin and see and might review with some blood glucose monitoring or if you feel that's too interventive just to repeat HbA1c in three months time. I think I would hope to try and get off the glargine in a relatively short period of time because I think the argument that Mabel needs tight blood glucose control. As I say, she's got an HbA1c of 8.2. So you can say, well, that's already a bit high. The level of HbA1c at which people get um, symptom symptoms clearly varies. It is said that for people, if, you're, if your blood glucose is a, 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 at 15 or 20 for more than two or three days, you're likely to feel um, some osmotic symptoms from your hypoglycemia, uh, maybe in even a shorter time than that. So I think what I do with Mabel is halve the, halve the, the, uh, the glargine and see. Um, I hope that helps, Gareth. Um, I think you're balancing. The problem is that, you know, to do the job, you might argue I need to do some blood glucose monitoring. And the question then is whether pricking the finger um, multiple times in somebody like Mabel is actually contributing to a deterioration in the quality of her life. Um, I don't know if you've used or seen the new uh, Libra um, continuous gl blood glucose monitoring things that, which don't require pricking the finger. Um, they do to t calibrate them, but once once the thing's on, you don't need to do multiple pricks. Um, they can be, uh, you know, you might perhaps even think about uh, if you've got one of have got access to something like that that is is new technology that's coming on the market that may help so gareth i hope that helps uh, i've probably been um not quite as precise as you might have wanted me to but you've got to take each individual patient in and in individualize what you think of might might you want to do and Rosalind said, thank you very much. I'm sure that my research has contributed to the funding of, the, of their care home team. Well, that'd be great if it, great if, if it, if it did, because I, I really do think that uh, 
people with diabetes living in care homes, you know, there are significant improvements to their quality of life that can be made and uh, and it can be as well cost effective to the health service to do that because there's, as I said, significant amounts of overtreatment out there. If I just ask you another question, one of the things when you look at the case scenario of Brian, one of the things that often we can miss is depression in older people. And you may know that there's an association with depression and diabetes. And it is possible that someone like Brian in that case scenario one is actually suffering from some background depression. He lives alone, he's been widowed for two years, he feels lonely. And the assessment that you would think would want to make as a healthcare professional is, is to do a depression screen and see if, if Brian also, some of his symptoms might be explicable by depression and that if it were, if he were depressed, you might think that, that some treatment might be appropriate in that situation. Any more questions coming up? If not, we're probably going to finish the webinar a bit earlier tonight. Um, if, I've, if, I've, if I have actually been able to answer all your questions. Um, just leave a minute or two. Yeah. So anybody else, anybody else got anything to say? No, if not, then um, I'll sign off. Thank you very much indeed for taking part in the webinar. Thank you for your very helpful questions. And thank you very much, Rosalind, for saying that uh, something I've done might have helped. Um, I'm really that, that really is is um, it's thrilling because to, to uh, do research and feel that you've been able to influence practice is uh, is is really very very important uh, people do research for all sorts of reasons but uh, clinical research the sort of stuff I like to try and do is is you know you, you're there doing it to try and improve practice so if you've been able to do practice and if you've been able to improve things that really is great so thank you very much indeed for those helpful comments thank you so if there's no more else, we'll sign off then. Thank you very much indeed for taking part.